much for inviting me here to, to talk to you. I was um, asked to talk about the adult clinic and given about half an hour, but I thought actually I probably could talk, actually I probably could talk half an hour because I'm awful, but um, I probably couldn't talk for half an hour, so I've taken a little bit of cheeky, um, just a bit, bit cheeky and do a few other things as well. So I'm going to talk about the adult clinic. Um, I also come with children's clinic as well, of course, but um, I think people are wondering a bit about what the adult service um, offers. I've also taken the opportunity to review from a genetics perspective um, what we've been doing over the last six or seven years, so I've got some data that I wanted to share with you. Um, and then on the final bit of it, I thought I'd do just a little bit about understanding genetics and going through probably the most common um, questions that people are asking. So firstly, that adult um, clinic, and I'm really presenting this on behalf of Ben Wright, who's the clinical lead for the service. But as genetics doesn't change, I cover both the, um, the children's and the adult service. So I just wanted to put it into context to start with. Um, and just to say that the multidisciplinary clinics were established in October 2011. The first adult clinic, I think, was in um, to the beginning of 2012. So we followed the children's service. And it was established with funding that was given um, from what's called the Specialist Services of the NHS England. Um, at the moment, there are four clinics a year at Birmingham Children's Hospital, and those children's <coughs> clinics actually cover two whole days, and the children get a whole lot of assessments um, in that period. At the, um, the adult clinics, there's only three a year at the moment. But I was going to say, there are five this year, six this year. Oh, I've only got five in my diary. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this coming year there are six. Oh, next coming year there are six. Okay. And um, that's important because you'll see from, from the numbers. And they're at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And they're actually only half a day at the moment and they don't get um, all the assessments that, um, that the children do. But probably we're working towards towards that. And the people who are referred either have a confirmed diagnosis of orphan syndrome or a suspected diagnosis and, and we, um, we assess them. So this is the um, data that Ben Wright has given me over the last um, six calendar years really for, for the adult activity. Um, so we're seeing sort of 20 to 25 patients a year in these clinics. But as we have 38 active patients on our books, you can see that that isn't quite, quite enough. Um, in the initial period, it was um, lots of new patients, but now we see a lot of follow-ups. But there is a steady trickle of new patients as, as well. Um, so there are three new patients pending review. I think we saw one just a week or so ago. And I always struggle with the new patient concept because I think I know most of the children, but of course I know <coughs> that adult services. Um, so mostly for me then. Um, the team for the adult services is currently is led by the neurologist, there's an endocrinologist, myself as the genetic <coughs> a neuro-ophthalmologist, and we also have um, Talia, who's what's called an eye liaison, <coughs> and she's really, really good and helps you for um, <coughs> making sure you've got the benefits and services that you are entitled to, and I think that's a real asset to, to the service. We're seen at the Rare Disease <coughs> Centre at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is a really nice uh, facility. Mostly, ben likes to see all patients jointly, and I think that does work, but I also think that sometimes um, you as patients have personal things that you want to talk to individuals about. So for genetics, for example, I'm sure that the ophthalmologist doesn't want to hear me talking for half an hour, so um, I think we do um, dip in and out of the, the, the clinic setting. During the clinic, um, we get a neurological, <coughs> endocrine, ophthalmology, and genetic assessments have the necessary blood samples that's personalised to, to what's needed, and also a BMI check. 
So at the moment, it's a very defined caseload, but there is an increased clinical activity. Um, recently, we've had a rise in late cancellations. I think that's partly because people are getting their appointments quite late, and that's because Ben doesn't have a secretary at the moment, so they're working on, on that. Um, but we have proposals to expand the team to a, a speech and language therapist, urologist, audiologist, radiologist, psychiatrist, who was there in the early days but then retired, um, and all these are sort of pending <coughs> contractor agreements, as I understand it. So what we also need to do is give an increased notice period for the, for the clinics, um, and we will have more activity once we, we start the trials as well. So that was all I wanted to say about that adult service, which is, it is very different to the, the children's service, but um, that's partly because of all the assessments that the children get in those two, two days. So what I've now done is look at the whole <coughs> service, both children's and um, adults, since we started. But this is from my perspective, it's my data. Um, um, it's, it's not all the information I could possibly have had. So um, just to start with, Wolfram syndrome has an estimated frequency of about 1 in 770,000. And you can use statistics to work out that that means that 1 in 438 people are carriers of the condition. That's very precise, but it's probably somewhere between 1 in 350, 1 in 450. You can't be so definite with such a rare condition. And the four most common features of the disorder are the diabetes insipidus, <coughs> the diabetes mellitus, optic atrophy, and deafness, which is why it, it was originally called Dignod syndrome. Um, and it's caused by alterations. I call it alterations. The new medical buzzword is variants, um, but also they can be mutations in the Wolfram syndrome gene, which is WFS1. And so how do we make a diagnosis of Wolfram syndrome? And there have been very strict diagnostic criteria developed. Um, and they use the clinical features that we see in the condition um, together with the results of genetic testing. But increasingly, our genetic tests are helping us define the diagnosis. And what we, what we say is there are minimum criteria for making the diagnosis. And they're divided into major and minor criteria. Um, but we also, these things are, medicine's not an exact science like something, so we do have to use um, common sense and experience as well. So these are the criteria. So the major criteria are having diabetes mellitus and optic atrophy less than 16 years of age. I'm happy to share all these slides with you. I can see people clicking away, but I am happy to share all these with you. Um, so the major criteria is diabetes mellitus and an optic atrophy at less than 16 years of age. And then the minor criteria, diabetes insipidus or sensory or hearing loss. And then diabetes mellitus or optic atrophy over the age of 16. And then some neurological features as well, renal problems but also the results of genetic tests. Now, if you have a genetic test and the results clearly show that you have Wolfram syndrome, we confirm the diagnosis. But sometimes we only find one alteration in the Wolfram syndrome gene, however hard we look. So we have to bring that in as well, but we can't, confirm, we can't use that test alone to confirm the diagnosis. So I've looked at all the patients that we've seen across both sides. And I think we have seen, over the years, 86 patients in clinic. 49 in the adult clinic, 37 in the children's clinic. And seven have gone through transition, I make it. But I think there's quite a few young adults who are about to be transitioned from the paediatric to the, to the adult clinic. I've also looked at the addresses of the patients, their ethnic background, the number of affected individuals in the family, and the results of the genetic tests. 
And altogether, we've had 86 patients from 70 families. So in the families, there's one affected individual in 55 families. We've got two affected individuals in 13 families. And in two families, we've got three affected individuals. Um, and then the ethnic background is um, 45 of North European ethnicity, five of Southern European, um, and 36 from the um, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic um, groups. And I've put the number of families in, 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 in brackets there. So I've just plotted it on a chart um, of the UK regions where patients come from. Um, and West Midlands is high, East Midlands is high, and the North West is, is high. And then I did a map as well demonstrating it. So, um, but it is across the whole of, of the UK. So thinking about the diagnostic criteria, thinking about the major and the minor criteria, we see quite a lot of people who don't quite fit Wolfram syndrome, um, but they have some features that, that we're worried about. Um, or their inheritance doesn't look right. The way it's running in families looks different to what we expect. And we now know that as well as classic Wolfram syndrome, there are a couple of other conditions that are associated with alterations in this WFS1 gene. So the majority of patients that we see in our clinic have classic Wolfram syndrome. It's inherited in what we call a recessive or autosomal recessive pattern. And I've got some slides of that in, in a minute. Um, but we also see, we have a few patients with what we call Wolfram syndrome-like disease. We've seen three um, UK families. I've actually seen some others in my other clinics that don't warrant needing to come to the Wolfram Clinic because I'm happy with what their diagnosis is. Um, but this is a condition that's inherited in a different way and you get features of usually diabetes and optic atrophy but not the other features of the condition. But it comes on later um, and it's associated with just one alteration in the Wolfram Syndrome gene rather than two. So that's, that's quite a different condition. It can be difficult to tell when you've got a child, but as soon as you've got adults and a strong family history, it's much easier for us to interpret. And the other thing that we haven't seen at all is that some alterations in this gene cause um, hearing loss at low frequencies and no other features of Wolfram syndrome. In, in classic Wolfram syndrome, the, hearing loss tends to be at high frequencies, not low frequencies. So there's three um, types of condition associated with this, with this gene. So this slide is wrong because I forgot to do a couple of things with it last night, <coughs> which is that we've got, it should say, where it says 66, it should say 83, and where it says 2, it should say, say 3. But we've got 83 patients with classic um, Wolfram syndrome, what we've seen them over the years. Um, seven have atypical features of the condition or have rather unusual alterations in their, in their genes. So that was my sort of overview of the service and where we've seen the patients from. And I just wanted to go through a little bit of genetics if that's all right. Time. So, actually the teenagers are really brilliant at this because they do it at DCSE and they find it really interesting, I think. Um, but what you have to do to understand why the condition develops is just think of our bodies as made up of millions and millions, trillions of cells actually. And in every cell in the body, this is point. Oh, that one. <laughs> right, so trillions and trillions of cells. In every cell 
in the body. So this is one cell. In the middle of the cell are the chromosomes. And the chromosomes are just like filing cabinets for all the instructions that make us what we are. And those instructions are called genes. So this I've just illustrated a gene which is made up of DNA. So I always think of the chromosomes as looking like you know when you do your shopping and the barcodes that are black and white codes, that's what the chromosomes look like down the microscope, and that is one cell down the microscope. So you see these little wiggly worms with stains on them. And that's there's 46 there, but it is much easier to think of them as pairs. So there's 23 pairs of chromosomes that are numbered according to how big they are. The biggest ones are one. The smallest ones are 22. And the last pair is made up of two X chromosomes in women, and then an X and a little Y chromosome in, in men. So the only difference between males and females is this last chromosome. All the rest are exactly the same. And so several years ago, there was a photographic exhibition at, at, in the genetics department at Guy's Hospital. And this is one of my favourite photographs, which is of the chromosomes looking rather like stripy socks. <laughs> and it's a really good analogy because it shows you the stripes that we see on the chromosomes in the laboratory. But the other thing that's really good about it is if these socks are knitted and you unpicked each of the chromosomes, you would see that there's so much genetic information on each chromosome. And in fact, if you, if you took all the genes, all the DNA, in all the cells of the body, it would stretch from here, from the Earth to the Sun, and back 600 times. That is how much genetic material we have in our bodies. So for me, people always ask me, why did this go wrong? But for me, I was think it's amazing that most of the time things work really well. So I've just drawn a picture of chromosome 4 up here with all its stripes. And very close to the top is what we call the WFS1 gene. And there are literally hundreds of genes on this chromosome. Now one of the questions that people always ask is, well, there's WFS1, what about the others? There is a WFS2 gene, but that has only been seen a few times in Jordanian families, and it's literally three or four families. Um, and they have orphan syndrome, but don't tend to have the diabetes insipidus, so it's a little bit different, and we haven't seen it at all in any of our, in any of our families. Um, it's it's um, just in a small subgroup. So I just wanted to briefly go through recessive inheritance with people because one of the questions that people ask me is, I've got Wolfram syndrome myself, what's my chance of having a child with the condition? So the reason that Wolfram syndrome develops is because our parents have an alteration in one copy of their Wolfram syndrome gene. They don't get they don't get any features of the condition themselves because the second copy of the gene is normal and that will compensate for the alteration in the gene. And we are all, there's, there's probably three or four thousand different recessive conditions and we will all be carriers of some of those conditions. And it doesn't matter. But if our parents are both carriers of the same recessive condition, then when we have children, we can pass on one of each gene. One of each gene comes from mum, one comes from dad. So mum can either pass on the normal one or the gene with the alteration in it, and dad can either pass on the normal one or the gene with the alteration in it. And then there are four possible combinations. So you can get two normal ones, and you'll never know about the condition. You can get a normal one from mum and a mutation from dad, then you're a carrier and you don't know about it. 
the other way around, normal one from dad, mum with the mutation, that's a carrier, that's not a problem. But if you get the mutation, you get alteration from both mum and dad, you haven't got a normal copy of the gene to do the work that we need it to do. So for parents who've had a child with a condition, we talk about there being a one in four chance of it happening. But there's no memory of what went on before, so it's always a one in four chance of happening for each pregnancy. So when we draw our family trees, and we draw men as squares and women as circles, we colour people in if they're affected, um, and we put a dot in the middle if you're a carrier. So when we draw a family tree, what we tend to see is affected brothers and sisters, the wider family are unaffected because it's the parents who were at risk of having the children with the condition. So that means that when I see individuals who want to know what's their chance of having a child with the condition, so at the top I've got an affected person who's got that double dose of the altered gene. On the whole, their partner will not be a carrier. One in 400 people are carriers, so you'd be unlucky for your partner to also be a carrier. So all your children will be carriers, but it's unlikely that they will be affected. But we can do some maths, and we know that in that situation there will be roughly a one in 800 chance of having an affected so it's a low chance, but it's not zero. So if we have, you know, almost if we have 400 people in our orphan clinic, one of them might have an affected child. It's that sort of statistic. And we can do a little bit of carrier testing for the partner, but it is quite, it is quite difficult. So the other thing I just wanted to mention was what, what is our DNA? What does our DNA do? How do we interpret alterations in genes? So what happens is our DNA is what we double-stranded, and it's made up of four chemicals that each have a chemical letter. And those letters are A, C, T, and G. That double-stranded DNA then divides in, effectively divides into two to get a single strand. And that single strand, the letters are read as an instruction, and it makes a protein. And the way it makes protein is three, a, a group of three letters are read to make an amino acid, and then all the amino acids join together to make a protein. And so this at the bottom, which is a series of those A, T, C's and G's, is is a little bit of the Wolfram syndrome gene, the code in the Wolfram syndrome gene. And it's just a tiny bit of it. And right in the middle, there's a C, which should be an A. So the genetic scientists in the laboratory have to decide, is this significant and causing problems, or is it just a normal variation? If I took a blood test from me, I probably have several million variations in my DNA code that mo mostly will be normal. It just is where, why we're all different. But some will be significant. And so the scientists have to decide if that um, is significant or not. <coughs> and so we think of mutations or alterations as spelling mistakes. And this is my recipe for a quiche that I might have done with some people. I've realised that this works well, I think. So to make a quiche, I have to add one egg and the ham. It's a ham quiche. <laughs> um, and then you can get lots and lots of different variations in that spelling. In, in, you can have spelling mistakes all along it. So another one might be add one egg and the ham. Now that's just a normal variation. We do exactly the right thing. So at the end of making my quiche, I get my quiche. Add one egg and the jam. Not very nice, but it probably isn't that significant. It's edible. 
and one egg and the hat. Not so good. Add the ham. Not very good. The one that's a real problem is if you're missing a letter, then everything after that, the groups of three, can't read properly. So you get junk. You get a donny, go, dan, do, her, whatever. You can't read it. And that's the sort of spent mistake in the gene that is significant and will cause problems. Add one egg, you can get bits extra. Add one egg, one egg and a ham. Not too bad. Add one egg, any car and the ham. Not great. Add one egg, and then the next one, instead of saying and, says end, the protein stops being produced. So everything that follows after it is missing, and that is also a significant alteration in the gene. So it's quite a complex thing in the laboratories to decide what is significant and what isn't, particularly for rare diseases where often these spelling mistakes haven't been reported before. Um, so that's why for some people I have to say to them, with, at the moment we're calling it a variant of uncertain significance not sure if it's causing problems or, or not. Um, but on the whole, we, we're getting very close to So I've just put up my final slide, which is like, in the UK, actually, over the last 10 years, there's been quite a significant, uh, uh, the government has really understood that rare diseases are important. So I think in the past, maybe still, people have felt very isolated having a rare disease. You're told you've got a rare disease, there's only one in 700,000 people with them. But actually, if you add all the rare diseases together, they are significant, and about one in 17 people in the United Kingdom will have a rare disease. They're not all genetic, 80% of them are, but um, the government has really taken this on board and there's been quite a lot of funding for rare diseases. So. I'm hopeful that in the future things will, will look better for us. And I'll finish there. Thank you.